Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to today's FS Club webinar. I'm here uh, speaking from London, and I'm absolutely delighted to have Professor Russell Napier uh, addressing us from Edinburgh today. And we're talking about a project that when it first came to my attention to a dear friend of mine, uh, George Littlejohn, I was absolutely captivated. So we're here today to talk about changing the world, one mistake at a time, the work of the library of mistakes. We'll get into that, obviously, in just a moment. Now, you'll know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien, and I'm able to introduce uh, so many of these webinars, and, and it's so enjoyable, principally because our FS Club sponsors allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. And today, we're going to be looking very much at the economic and finance angle here. Uh, Russell is going to be uh, following our, our kind of usual format. Uh, my job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible so you can hear from our expert. Uh, and Russell will speak for approximately 20 minutes, and then today we're going to have a question and answer session. Now, I've never really had any difficulty with FS Club community members asking questions, but I think today you're going to have quite a few, uh, and I hope to feed your questions, comments, and observations into a discussion with Russell at 425. Uh, three points of housekeeping before we begin. Uh, the first one is very much that the slides are available and up on the web, so if you need to watch us at the same time or look at them afterwards, they're available. Secondly, yes, this is being recorded, and the recording will go up in approximately two working days, so probably uh, Monday morning, roughly. Uh, but thirdly, and most importantly, uh, to feed into the discussion today and influence the direction of things, please use the GoToWebinar question and answer facility you're very welcome to email me, WhatsApp me, WeChat me, signal me, text me, whatever. Uh, but I'm here with you right now, and I'll only get those later. So please feed them into the GoTo chat facility. All of your questions and comments uh, will be sent to Russell uh, with your email attached to it. So if you want something specific or like to chat to him, just simply type in there, I'd like to chat to you, and we'll make sure that Russell gets all of that. Now, it's an exciting uh, time in the world. It's always been an exciting time, and it took the scientific community ages uh, to work out that the mistakes in science uh, were just as important as the successes, in fact, arguably more so. What are the dead end avenues? But finance, well, finance is richer. Finance is not quite science, but did it have something to learn? And I think that's really what we're here to explore today. People claim that their biggest learning is from their mistakes, well, prove it. And I think that's what Russell's going to chat to us about. So Russell, the floor is very much yours. Michael, thank you very much. Uh, I am here wearing my hat as keeper of the Library of Mis Mistakes. I'm self-appointed, which are the best titles are the ones where you self-appoint. Uh, you can see from my opening line here, you'll maybe recognize this from Dylan Thomas, Rage Rage Against the Dying of the Light. Well, we rage rage at the Library of Mistakes against the decimal point, and I am about to tell you why we think it's a charitable venture to rage against the decimal point. Here is the problem, and many people tell me it is an unsolvable problem. And Michael, you've alluded to it as to how science learns from its mistakes. But this is from James Grant. Many of you will know James Grant from Grant's Interest Rate Observer. He said, progress is cumulative in science and engineering, but cyclical in finance. And you could see why it might be cyclical in finance if all it was was greed and fear, because greed and fear are always with us. Uh, but at the Library of Mistakes, we believe that we can help take it slightly beyond greed and fear so it doesn't have to be this natural cyclicality uh, where knowledge is forgotten uh, and knowledge can be passed on. You might think, well, that's happening anyway at our august uh, learning institutions, and it is in a form, but not in the form that we are practicing at the Library of Mistakes. Can we have the next uh, slide, please? So let me just begin by telling you what the library actually is before we get on to its purpose. It is a public library in Edinburgh, open to the public. There is also one in Pune, at the Flame University. And we have been trying now for 14 months to open one in Lausanne. It is there, it is ready, it is willing, it is able, but the regulations aren't. So we will be opening in Lausanne as well. It is primarily at this stage a collection of business and financial history books. It is a real thing. Uh, but as you will uh, understand as I go through this, we hope to widen that well beyond the mistakes of the financial community uh, into other areas. Apart from providing the resource of the of the books, we uh, run regular lectures or had run regular lectures. Uh, our little library can only take 30 people sitting down, so we have been doing these adventures with other people. And uh, one of the last ones we did was at the Edinburgh 
International Convention Center where we had over 150 members of the public learning about financial history. Who knew that the public was that interested in financial history? Uh, it was the financial history of Edinburgh, so that clearly helped. Uh, but we are reaching out to a wider uh, community than just those who might be interested in, in finance. Uh, on our website, and you'll get the details for that at the end, we record some of these uh, lectures and they are all posted up onto the website and are there for you to see. Uh, next lecture, please. Just finally now on our next uh, chart, please. Uh, finally on the technicalities, we are owned by a charity called the Didasco Education Company, which also runs a course in finance called the Practical History of Financial Markets. So we've been at this financial history thing for quite a long time, since 2004. Uh, the library came along in 2014 as an adjunct to that. Uh, and we have within our umbrella of the Didasco a, another charity called Future Assets, which is promoting and encouraging uh, finance and investment uh, careers for uh, high school girls to, to consider, at least consider, when they're planning out their, their, their future advancement. Uh, and finally, uh, you can't have any charity or any organization these days without a mission statement. So we have our mission statement. And uh, Latin scholars, please, please excuse my pronunciation, but here we go. Mundum mutato errore singulatum, changing the world one mistake at a time, which I hope was fairly close. Uh, so now why? Why bother? So if we can have the next slide, please. So we are primarily a financial history and business library, but here are the things that we're studying which may not be studied by the, uh, the student of finance. Human decision-making under uncertainty, you'll recognize that from the Kahneman citation for his uh, uh, Rich Bank Prize of 2002. Uh, he's a psychologist and studies it as a psychologist. We think it can be studied as historians. We can study the history of human decision-making under uncertainty. And of course, Kahneman is confined to the individual, the psychology of the individual. We as uh, financiers are concerned with the psychology of the group, and that can be different. And one way we can study that is simply by studying history. Secondly, the equation which has come to dominate understanding of finance is a distillation. And all, I'm quite keen on distillation, particularly when you stick it and leave it in a barrel for 12 years. That's one of the finest forms of distillation we have. But the point of distillation is to throw something away. And uh, that's the spent grain. And I think we are throwing away quite a lot when we boil something down to the equation uh, in finance, sociology, psychology, politics, philosophy. Uh, the other joys of uh, financial history, well, we have to learn to ask the right question. I see people every day in, in my business and my day job is in finance and investment who are always getting the right the right answers but sadly they're getting them to the wrong questions and uh, i think a deep reading of financial history will at least help you ask the right questions will it help you get the right answers more problematical but at least the right questions uh, also there is this huge problem which i will go into in a bit more detail in the difference between uncertainty and risk and the world is full of risk professionals who i think try and shoehorn uncertainty into the concept of risk uh, to the detriment of risk and to the detriment of uncertainty and to the detriment of finance. And the study of financial history is a study of risk, but also a study of uncertainty. Uh, and finally, studying the mistakes of the past does prepare us for contact with the enemy. I'm just going to go through each of those in a little bit more detail, and that will complete why we think the world needs more financial history education. You can see this is the citation for Daniel Kahneman of 2002 for having integrated insights from psychological research into economic science, especially concerning human judgment and decision-making under uncertainty, behavioral finance. Most of our young people these days get an element of behavioral finance when they study economics or when they study finance. But it is a study from a psychological perspective, and it isn't necessarily uh, the study of this in practice, of real decisions made by real people. Uh, and we can actually track those often uh, in real time or fairly real time through what was in the press, brokers research, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, at the time. So we're not saying it replaces this approach to human decision making under uncertainty, but we're saying it bolsters it, it helps it. And if you're not going to get, if you're not going to get it from reading about decisions of the past, which were influenced by feedback loops, by mass psychology, uh, then I don't know where you're going to get it from, if not from there. And that's what we get when we read financial history. So we are adding something which I think is absent from a traditional finance slash economic slash investment education. Uh, next PowerPoint, please. Financial history is a partial antidote to data mining. Uh, that first quote is often attributed to Lord Keynes. Wouldn't it be great to be Lord Keynes or Albert Einstein, where every clever thing ever said in the world was always attributed to you 
even though you never said it. So uh, William Bruce Cameron actually said this, not everything that can be counted counts, not everything that counts can be counted. When we over mathematize our industry, it leads us to count the things that can be counted and not to count the other things. And the idea in a market, and remember a market definition of a market is where people get together to establish a price. That's an inherently sociological phenomenon. And it may not be one where everything that counts uh, can be counted. Uh, but of course, the beauty of looking back into history is that you are reading and understanding everything. And it's not everything that can be counted that appears in, in history. It, history is not full of decimal points and numbers. History is full of stories. And the market is a story. It is not an equation. Uh, torture the data long enough uh, and it will confess. We think and hope that financial uh, history and an understanding of it is somewhat of an antidote to that. Uh, if it leads you to ask the right questions, it potentially hopefully tells you when the only answers you're getting are ones of confession rather than truth. And that is why we think that some ways it can help uh, people with a already a, a good understanding of the mathematics of finance and investment uh, to ask the right questions and accept the right answers and reject the wrong answers that have come through torture and confession. Uh, next PowerPoint, please. So here are some of the spent grain that we throw away currently when we, we over mathematize finance politics. Uh, one of the assumptions in, in, in most modern finance is that the government is a referee in a game of supply and demand. Well, I think the whole new generation is being educated that that is not correct, that the government is not a referee, the government is a participant. And when the government is a participant, and that varies over the generations and through ages, it fantastically changes uh, supply and demand and changes price. Uh, but once again, how do you put that uh, purely in numerical terms? And if we, if we create a brand of finance that doesn't even consider politics, are we doing ourselves any favors or are we doing society any favors? Uh, sociology, I'm referring here slightly to the work of uh, Michael, uh, Professor Sandel. Uh, there are some things that money aren't, isn't allowed to buy, and those things change from generation to generation, from age to age. And those are not, once again, something that we can put in a decimal point. What society believes is acceptable for a market to price and what it isn't, and what prices are acceptable and what prices aren't. These are often psycho or sociological phenomenon and not market phenomenon. Once again, if we don't read financial history, we discard those from the equation. Psychology, uh, I've mentioned Kahneman already. I don't have to go back through that, but people looking at the word reflexivity in here will realize instantly that that refers to George Soros. And the interesting thing about psychology, Soros said that the, 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 the price of a financial instrument can change the fundamentals. Now that is something which is entirely unheard of in standard finance, which believes that the price of a security reflects the fundamentals. Now, if we're going to leave it, live in a world where actually the psychology affects the fundamentals, how do we put that into an equation? Why do we take that out? And yet if we read financial history, you will see over and over and over again how feedback loops in particular uh, have influenced the so-called fundamentals. Philosophy, what is value? I think that's a three-hour lecture. What is value to a philosopher? But clearly it also plays a role uh, in what we will consider to be uh, value in the future. Uh, these things, there may be ability to slice all these things up and study them individually and put them back into the education of a speculator, sorry, education of a financier. Uh, but the easy way to look at all of them uh, is to read financial history. Uh, can we have the next chart, please? Now, this is from Frank Knight, and it's really important because it's something that we've got, I think, exceptionally wrong in, in finance. And I'm going to read it in full because it's a, an important concept. And it's the difference between risk and uncertainty, and we do an extremely bad job in finance of dividing the two. Uh, Knight said that uncertainty must be taken in a sense radically distinct from the familiar notion of risk from which it has never been properly separated. The essential fact is that risk means in some cases a quantity susceptible of measurement, while at other times it is something distinctly not of this character. And there are far reaching and crucial differences in the bearings of the phenomena depending on which of the two is really present and operating. Risk is easily defined. If I start rolling a, a properly loaded uh, six-sided dice, I can predict with a high degree of accuracy, if I keep rolling it, what numbers will come up on the dice. Uncertainty is entirely different. It may be what form of technology is dominant in the world 20 years from now. Now, that is not susceptible to measurement in the way that the roll of a dice is, and it is uncertainty. Uh, and as a financial historian, I would say it's the, more, it's the most profound uncertainty we have to deal with because it, it regularly changes the world. 
how on earth do we cope with that? Well, if we begin to cope with it by trying to force it into the trammels of an equation with a decimal point, there is a risk that we mismeasure it. We mismeasure it because we can count it, and therefore because we can, uh, because we, because we can count it, or because we want to put it into numbers, we try to count something which is not susceptible to counting. How on earth would we learn about uncertainty as distinct from risk? I'm sure there are brighter people watching this who had some pretty good suggestions about that. My suggestion is simply to read financial history, to realize that there are other risks in front of us that are not susceptible to measurement. And actually trying to measure them and quantify them may be the most dangerous thing we can try and do rather than try and cope with the uncertainty. So I think one of the, one of the great things about financial history is it can begin to help us divide risk from uncertainty, not in any completely objective way, but at least begin to recognize this uh, as a major problem we have and begin to deal with it. Uh, next PowerPoint, please. Finally, I think this is my final use of financial history. Uh, this is uh, the spelling Carl von Clausewitz, General Carl von Clausewitz. No plan of operation extends with certainty beyond the first encounter with the enemy's main strength. Or put more succinctly by Mike Tyson, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Uh, same sentiment. What is a study of financial history? It's a study of the, pun the punches in the mouth that can be delivered. You know, the modern investor, whatever period of history they've lived through, well, they've been delivered these punches to the mouth. They've had to react to them. Often they've had to learn on the job, but they may only have been in business for 10 years or 20 years. And the, you know, there's a vast uh, range of punches of the mouth that have been delivered, and it would be good to study them uh, and to study the mistakes that people made when those had been delivered uh, and how you might have better responded uh, and we can do that through the study of financial history. Uh, next PowerPoint, please. Uh, this is my own favorite saying, because I made it up, and which is never trust a forecast with a decimal point. And I'm sure someone said it before, but uh, I have been uh, forecasting in financial markets now for 25 years, and I've never yet used a decimal point. And I hope I never have to use a decimal point. It uh, confuses my audience. Uh, it confuses them that they think that I'm that smart. Uh, but it also confuses me because it might make me think that I'm also that smart. Uh, and when it comes to the future, it does not lend itself to the decimal point, yet the decimal point prevails. We need to ask the right questions. It is better to be vaguely right than exactly wrong. And the people I see who spend most of their life asking the wrong questions are because they want to ask questions to which they can have a decimal point in the answer. And it's a natural security blanket which we all as human beings want to head towards. What do we know for sure about human beings? This above all else, the human being abhors uncertainty and therefore will always manufacture a certainty to cling on to. That is life. What is the worst form of uncertainty? It's the decimal point in the forecast. Uh, that's the form of created certainty that we, that we cling on to. Uh, I think financial history can, can help us ask better questions and, and accept that being vaguely right is hopefully better than being exactly wrong. Uh, next PowerPoint, please. Well, that's it. That is a summary of, I think, some of the reasons why we should be studying business and financial history, but we need to broaden it. Generals face the same problem. Uh, Wellington used to say that the, the, only, the only role of being a general and the only role in life is to guess what's on the other side of the hill. So really, no matter what profession we are in, we are guessing what's on the other side of the hill. And the equation, don't get me wrong, is a very valuable and useful tool with which to do so. But it is not the only telescope to the other side of the hill. There are others. And the, role, the job of the Library of Mistakes is to take a fully rounded investment professional and add another quiver to their bow of how they think about the world, think about risk, and think about uncertainty. And there are the contact details for the Library of Mistakes, our course will be in London teaching again in October, hopefully in real life with real people in a real venue. Uh, and if you'd like to contact me, uh, please feel free to do so. And uh, can I just say that we have a library of mistakes in Edinburgh. We have one in Pune. We have one in Lausanne, but we don't have one in London. And maybe it's true that mistakes simply aren't made in London. And at that point, Michael, over to you. Oh, you handed that one on a plate. Russell, that was excellent. What a great exposition of, of frankly, a brilliant concept and one long overdue and delighted to see. Um, got a lot of folks, do keep your questions and comments coming. Uh, I can see somebody, Alan Punter, is saying he's going to give two possible contributions to the library. Um, but let's just start with a, a sort of just a basic element here. 
Uh, Russell, one might argue that one man's uh, mistake is another man's investment gain. Um, so what constitutes a mistake? And perhaps you can give us an example of when you say mistake, what are you saying? And, and also something that uh, an outside person might say is obviously a mistake, but isn't. Well, the two mistakes that I am most fond of are the man who burnt the um, burnt the barley. His name was J. Arthur Guinness. So that was a mistake that he made. We all profited from. There was a French cook who burnt the sugar and created caramel. So, you know, we, we need to stop looking at mistakes as a bad thing. They are potentially a good thing. A lot of creativity uh, comes comes out of mistakes. Uh, the word, the phrase library of mistakes, uh, Michael, to be honest, it's really a marketing gimmick for a business and financial history library. Because if I called it a business and financial history library, nobody would turn up. Yeah, they'd all go to sleep. <laughs> and, and when I ran through the five or six different things that we can use financial history for, I mean, learning from mistakes was just one of them. Uh, but there are many other reasons that we can, can use it for. The library of mistakes is full of successes as well. It is not just full of mistakes. It is also full of successes. But it's to, uh, there's only one profession I'm aware of that learns from all its mistakes without exception and that you know and those are pilots mm. and the reason that they learn is they have a black box I, I would argue that financial history is our closest thing we have to a black box it's it's far from perfect uh, but it is the closest thing we have so it's the black box it's the only black box we have to learn from unfortunately we'll never be as uh, pr uh, proficient as pilots but we can hope to do slightly better by utilizing this black box with its mistakes with its successes uh, with everything else yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting point there. I, mean, I, I at one point was indirectly in charge of uh, the, the, the reporting in the United Kingdom on near misses, um, but also uh, in the electricity industry, there's something similar. There used to be in the rail sector uh, under the old British rail system. There was in the gas industry um, and certainly in the nuclear and the, the and, and also in medical. We set up something called the Clinical Negligence Scheme for Trusts in the UK in the early 90s, and they all had reporting systems. And the reporting systems varied depending on how much blame was attached to it or whether it was neutral. And that was the great thing about the air pilots was if it was reported, then they investigated it without blame. But if you failed to report it, then everybody in it was assumed to be culpable. A uh, very interesting way of forcing the information out. We don't really have that in finance, do we? People tend to roll up their tent and their Ponzi scheme and slope away, don't they? <laughs> Yes. Well, a, lot of, a lot of these decisions are made in committees, and because they're never recorded, there's nobody who's responsible. So there are perhaps better ways of doing that as well. Now, you were kind enough to be honest about a marketing gimmick, uh, but if it is an economic uh, historic, history library, what sort of contributions are you looking for, if any, or have you got far too much and your back archive is a, an enormous proportion of your collection? Well, I'm really, really what I would like to add to this particularly is the stuff that people consider to be of no value whatsoever. And by that, I mean contemporaneous opinion. Uh, I, I'm also an author of now two books. Uh, but in the first book, I uh, looked at the great bear market bottoms for equities in America. And what I looked at were mistakes to work out the bottom. So I read the Wall Street Journal for the people who were dreadfully mistaken, who at the bottom of the stock market were saying, you've got to sell this. It's dreadful. And I looked to see if there are any similarities across the four periods. Now, the only real place I could look for that was the press at the time, and in that case, particularly the Wall Street Journal. But wouldn't it have been truly wonderful if I had a full library of stockbrokers research and investment research for 1921 that I could have read? And there are people who are involved in finance here may have kept some of their favorite research from 2009 when everybody said sell. And that is the stuff we'd really like to get. Contemporaneous opinion. You know, it's the, it's the, um, the burden of the historian to write everything with the benefit of hindsight. What we need to see in terms of mistakes or how people made mistakes at the time. And when the history is written, we tend to write it about the people who were right. We don't tend to write it about the people that were wrong. So we can obviously access all the press now because it's all online and digitalized and that's wonderful. But a lot of this material, which is written analyzing markets, analyzing companies, uh, is destroyed, uh, disappears. It seemed to be of no value. But I think that contemporaneous opinion in understanding why we get things wrong at the, at the wrong times. I think it's invaluable and, and yet difficult to access. That might improve with, with digitalization. Now, um, you, you referred to your book, Anatomy of the Bear, which I think the FT referred to as a cult classic, which is high praise indeed. Um, you've also called yourself an economic historian, but if, if I recall rightly, you, you studied law um, initially. 
is there a proper discipline in this? Is this tied? Is, is this library tied to a particular discipline? Uh, and is that discipline finance? If the discipline isn't finance, who's educating financial people uh, on the importance of the library? Uh, so the, the discipline of, should go beyond finance because human decision making under uncertainty goes beyond finance. So, it, so the people who attend our lectures, by the way, are yeah, it's dominated by financiers, but there's people coming from all professions. Uh, and we are broadening those lectures to, to architecture, town planning, uh, things like this. We are linked through our course to the Edinburgh Business School. Uh, I actually run a financial history walking tour through Edinburgh where we physically drag students to the Library of Mistakes and force them to enter the Library of Mistakes on a, on a pretense to get them in there. Uh, obviously, we bring it to the attention of everybody we teach uh, at the Edinburgh Business School. And also, we, uh, when we run the course in London, we bring it to people's attention. So uh, I am a bit of a missionary for this. Uh, I would say not a very successful one, Michael. So that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm here on this speaking to you, is to try to persuade other people of the value of this approach uh, and the value of a, of a library of mistakes, but we absolutely need to get more people. I, what I find is people come with a finance degree into investment, and after five years, they're ready. They're ready to try something else. Okay. Well, I've got a lot of comments and questions. Um, I'll start with Hugh Purser, who says uh, he wonders if you're sort of the equivalent of junk DNA in the financial markets. You know, it's clearly not the junk people once thought it was. For, uh, for example, but he has a lovely little phrase here you might want to respond to quickly. If history is written by the victors, is the history of mistakes written by the losers? <laughs> the, uh, uh, what, what I would say is probably yes, but what we need to do is if we can get that contemporaneous opinion at the time, that allows us to make a somewhat objective assessment of mistakes as opposed to all history is, is contaminated by hindsight. Mm -hmm. If we write a history of contemporaneous opinion, we can to some extent cut through this problem that he that he mentions. It's a whole new field of history, in my opinion. I mean, it was always there if you wanted to sit down in front of the microfiche and go through it endlessly. But it is now there in the, on your computer screen. And I've seen a few historians use it, but actually nowhere near enough yet. So I accept that uh, kind of criticism, but I think we actually have a partial or a pretty good solution to it now. It's time consuming. Uh, it takes a while, uh, but, but we have a partial solution for the first time. Really. Um, Con Keating, who, who we may know, um, has a very short question, I, and I think it's deeper than it looks. He says, is the Museum of Mistakes itself a mistake? <laughs> uh, and I, I could see, in other words, some argument of almost hubris from it, but I know what's a mistake, but it implies everything else is going fine. Thank you very much. That's one approach. But any comments on that? Yeah, I, I guess if it was just a library of mistakes, the answer to that would be there's a, there's a high probability that that's what it is. But as I said, that's the name. What actually it is about is something bigger than that. It's not just about learning from mistakes. It's about studying human decision making under uncertainty. It's about putting politics and sociology back in. It's about moving us away from the equation. So if it was just solely about mistakes, I can see how that it was a uh, potentially a vanity project. But let's put it that way. But it is about so much more than that. So Alan Hunter is volunteering two contributions, Great Financial Disasters of Our Time by Alan N. Peachy, over 600 pages of newspaper cuttings, so you may regret that one, and also Roads to Ruin by Ermic, uh, in which he's a co-author, 18 case studies of corporate disasters, so uh, a lot going on there. But Alan's real question is, what are the plans to synthesize the lessons from the mistakes in the library? Well, we have a course in finance and teaches financial history. Now that course doesn't synthesize all the mistakes in the library of mistakes because such a thing would be impossible. But we've been running that since 2004. So we already have a formal educational process for teaching people about financial history, which may not be covering mistakes, but in terms of the other goals and aims of the library of mistakes, we've already you know, we've been doing that for 20 or so for 16 for 16 years now. So that's how we uh, intend to formalize it. Beyond that, it's simply running sufficient lectures and hopefully with new technology, broadcasting those to the uh, the world on, on elements of financial history that have and pertain to the future. So we have the course, uh, we have the lectures, we have the videos. Uh, the reason it's not a popular form of uh, learning is it's time consuming. You know, you can read four or five books on financial risk the mathematics of financial risk and if you're a bit of a genius i think you've got most of what you need to know in four or five books that's not the way it is with financial history but we do have this course uh, by the way we're working to put that into an online version and before the end of the summer we will launch with 
the Edinburgh Business School, Harriet Watt, we will be launching an online version of the course as well. So we are spreading the word uh, on financial history. Um, I've got quite a few questions, so I don't, I don't want to dwell on the collection too long, but I do think there's a, just a little bit of flavor to the collection would help. Um, how, how far back does it go? So sort of what's your oldest piece? In your opinion, what's kind of the most interesting thing to you? And Olivia Bosch is asking, you know, for example, is material from Warren Buffett in your library? So, yes, we, I mean, we go back to Greece and Rome to the extent that they're where we have textbooks on the Greek and Roman uh, economies. And also there was investment going on. You probably know there were kind of tax farming shares being sold uh, in Rome at the time. So it's, uh, even if we only did it to when financial instruments were created, that still gets you back to ancient Rome and ancient Greece. And if you think about it, if you're really studying human decision making under uncertainty, then you're going back as far as there have been human beings. So we're going back uh, a very long way. My own bent uh, as a professional is uh, the history of money and credit. Uh, so that's the bit of the library that's particularly interesting to, to me. And the, the history of those, I think, is particularly useful and helpful. Even on the shorter term horizons that many of us work in, in investment, I think they're particularly useful. I'm often asking, I mean, I think the number one question I get asked about the library book, a library is what is, what is the only book I should lead in the library of mistakes? That misconceives what a library actually is. But anyway, I'm prepared to give an answer. Thank you. Uh, I, and I think it's Triumph of the Optimist by Dimson, Marsh and Staunton, which is the history of financial returns. And I think unless you study the history of financial returns and know what each asset class can provide, then you are not calibrated to, uh, to understand uh, f finance. But the problem is that it's such a huge sphere. I mean, the history of finance is the, is the history of, of almost just about everything. Uh, mm -hmm. So we can narrow it down to the history of financial returns, I think, if you really, really only want to read it and focus on a few things. Uh, and for me, I would, as, as a professional, I would look at the, the history of money and the history of credit and how they've both been misused. And that's still a very broad sphere, but still not as broad as the whole of financial history. Now, there's a, another Keynes quote along the lines of, it, sir, in the long run, we're all dead. But um, uh, Donald McRae is curious, how long before a mistake in financial services or markets can be judged to be a mistake? <sighs> yeah, I think it's the same Donald McRae, whose book I've read, which is, a, which is, an, excellent, uh, which is an excellent book. Uh, I, there is no simple answer to that, because sometimes it can happen incredibly quickly. And I mean, so I, so I don't think there is an answer to that because it just varies entirely depending on, I mean, I can think of some mistakes that were proven wrong within two or three weeks, some huge mistakes that just went wrong incredibly quickly and others that took 10, 15 years. So sadly, you know, the nature of investment, particularly with interest rates so low, is that the future returns are priced so far in the future that one could argue that one has to wait 10, 15 years to make a, make a full uh, case on that. But no, I think in some cases it's much shorter than that. I mean, one of the biggest mistakes that we catalog in the library is, is fraud itself. My fraud is a mistake because I tend to believe the fraudster and I, and I lose money. And those, those things tend to be mistakes very quickly. So I, I'd love to give a, a, you know, a very precise answer to Donald, but I'm afraid it does vary a lot. But he's got a good point. Sometimes, uh, particularly when it comes to technology and investing in technology, it can take a very long time to work out what the value in that, in that technology was. But it is sadly variable as to how long it takes in finance and investment to work out how, what is a mistake. Hmm. Well, Marcus Johnson, I think, is having a good tease on you. He's sort of saying, would you consider moving the library from Edinburgh to New Darien? You could make a fortune. <laughs> well, let me tell you one story, because I did try to move the library across the Atlantic, uh, Michael, and I tried to move it to lower Manhattan. And I had a meeting with an August institution down there to discuss opening a library in on Wall Street. And you would probably be able to work out who it is from that description. Anyway, over lunch, I was explaining the joys of the Library of Mistakes, to which this gentleman said, this is Manhattan. We don't do mistakes. Amazing. So true. <laughs> At least we bury our dead. Um, Eric Brutman, styling in from Canada, from uh, Toronto. James Dyson argues that mistakes and errors are the key and only drivers of technology innovation, yet the wisdom of the innovators to do the right mistakes. Is there an approach or meta approach to what is what the right mistake is? Are these the cheap mistakes? You know, the fail fail swiftly, fail fast, uh, low impact mistakes. Any any thoughts on that? Well, uh, uh, Mr. Dyson knows a lot more about technology and innovation than I do. So who, who am I to uh, second second guess him? As a as a financier and investor, I think cheap mistakes are the best way forward. 
uh, you know, that is the best way to go. Find, you know, do something, do it quickly, and if it fails, move on. That's the modern way. I think actually it's a very good way uh, to do things. We don't often have, we don't always have the luxury uh, of doing that, doing it that way. But where that luxury exists, we should do it that way. And and of course, the whole thing about the library of mistakes is just to make sure that you're not doing a mistake that someone's already done. And, and that's easily possible. We live in a big world today, and it's certainly possible. And I see people repeating mistakes today that we've done many, many times before in finance. So that's not really technology, it's more finance. But certainly in finance, there are many mistakes you see being repeated uh, over and over again. So the first thing I think to do is to make sure you're not repeating the same mistake. Uh, at least if you're going to make a mistake, make a new one. Make it quick and then get, get on with it. Sounds very sensible advice. And uh, just moving forward on that, uh, the, the honest bit about technology, um, Hugh Purser is saying, uh, questioning, are most mistakes in financial history human ones and concentrated at the top of the managerial pyramid? On the other hand, David Crum is wondering, with a greater reliance in technology, will we make more mistakes when compared to the past and more material mistakes, a sort of sorcerer's apprentice element of life? Uh, any quick thoughts? Is this really going to become uh, probably more akin to FS Club, where we say technology, economics, and finance? Is this going to become a technology, economic, and finance uh, historical center? Yeah, I think the risk is we make we make more unless we start uh, re recalibrating because we're becoming so reliant on the technology and the mathematics to try and quantify something which is basically human. So one of the greatest problems in finance is extrapolation. Uh, it happens all the time. It happens every day. Uh, I know a, 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 an investor who swears because he's been in the markets before we even invented the Excel spreadsheet that uh, mis mistakes in the markets have increased dramatically since we invented the Excel spreadsheet because it used to take him quite a long time to extrapolate into the far future. But now any 12-year-old with an Excel spreadsheet can extrapolate for forever. So I'm afraid that the technology gives us greater ability to extrapolate. And, 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 and stripping out all of the things I've mentioned in this talk is the biggest mistake that we are making. So conceivably, the technology, because it takes us to this world where because it can be cut because we can count it we think it counts it, it doesn't you know there's smart people who don't use it that way but there are too many people who use it that way but it is much more likely to lead us to bigger mistakes than before because we're throwing away so much information in pursuit of counting something in the pursuit of our own certainty which we which we crave well no conversation these days seems to be complete without the b word but which b word am i referring to so uh Alan Punter has fed me, only a fool learns from his own mistakes, a wise man learns from the mistakes of the others. Bismarck, so there's one B word. But no, I don't mean Brexit, sadly, I mean Bitcoin. Jeremy Light, uh, the Bank of England governor says, Bitcoin has no intrinsic value because nothing backs it, implying that sterling has intrinsic value. What does he mean and why does something have to be backed to have value? And what you know, is Bitcoin another big mistake looming? So paper, uh, paper money isn't backed by uh, anything in, partic in particular either. Uh, Bitcoin, my, my reason for thinking it's a mistake is, is an entirely different one from the, from the points raised by, by the questioner. It, we have to consider the consequences for society and government if it succeeds. And the consequence of its success is that the supply of money moves primarily to the private sector and is not controlled through either the government or the central bank. Now, I do not believe that democracy could conceivably survive a world in which money is run and controlled by the private sector. I realize it's the libertarian's dream that this happens, and uh, maybe libertarians don't ultimately believe in uh, democracy, but it destroys so much. It certainly destroys the banking system. Uh, I think we all know the consequences of destroying the banking system. It destroys the ability of a government to reallocate wealth. And everybody on this call will have a different opinion on whether government should be reallocating wealth at all. But I think, you know, generally speaking, uh, some rebalancing of wealth is an important thing. And once you lose control of the supply of money, uh, I think that is given up. It is interesting to me that uh, the last time the governments didn't really control the supply of money is under the gold standard. But the gold standard never survived democracy. We don't have democracy until women get the vote. And the gold standard has gone pretty soon after that. So the problem for uh, Bitcoin, in my opinion, is, is the more it succeeds, the more it's doomed to fail because the, the, the authorities simply can't allow it to compete with their money. Now, that may mean creating their own central bank digital currency or whatever, but private sector currencies have no future in a democracy, and therefore I hope they have no future. Hmm. Okay. Um, Alexander Rottenberg, uh, a plea, I think, for um, age. Having been through various financial crises since the early 1970s, it has struck me that a major reason mistakes in banking are repeated is generation change. 
Put another way, banks oblige those who have been through the crises to retire. Uh, might there be a case for keeping on old timers who've seen it all and then can thus help the next generation from repeating the same mistakes? Uh, I certainly recall actually the Bank of England trying this approach about, I think it was about 10 years ago, they deliberately hired uh, a dozen wise old guys uh, to, to hang around and be available to chat. Uh, does your library fulfill some of this function? Yeah, yes, it does. And that's exactly why it is there is because of that. Uh, I think there's a thing called the COPOC indicator, which is entirely based upon the institutional memory being only of this length. And we need to extend that institutional memory. It's not just about hiring older people. Uh, there are many other ways we can do it. There, I mean, the, the city of London is full of people with tons of experience in this, and yet their knowledge is lost. You don't have to be a corporation to, to get that knowledge. These days, you can just put it on video. You can put it in the written format. There's, and, and we don't pass that knowledge on the way Madame Curie passed her knowledge on. And it is a shame, and it's a crying shame that it doesn't happen. It's the arrogance of youth to believe that the old know nothing about the modern world. Uh, but that's, that seems to be a pattern that repeats itself over and over and over again. Uh, so absolutely, by holding guest lectures and getting some of the people that have actually lived through some of these crises as well, then we hope to be in a situation to pass it on. But we need to do a much, much better job at this. It is shocking that the yeah. institutional memory is so short, and there's no good reason for it. Uh, and uh, and I find that, that the older generation, who may be some of them in their 80s now, I've been interviewing some recently, uh, they're desperate to pass on their knowledge, but there's no venue. Could you just repeat that indicator again for everybody? The the COPOC, the C O P P O C K. I think it's a, I think it's a seven year indicator. I'm not an expert on COPOC, but I think Mr. COPOC saw it as a measurement of institutional memory as to uh, when you expect things to begin to repeat that had happened before. It's quite interesting. The British Computer Society has launched a very large, very formal uh, program of getting old timers to speak. Sadly, I know I'm one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's very, very thorough, you know, a life history, a validation, uh, an hour's interview. Um, it's it's an amazing program. And I, I don't know of anything comparable in finance except, you know, hey, geographies. This is actually quite a, a grueling bit. Um, I've got time for two uh, more quick questions. Uh, one from Keith Robinson, which I think is very subtle. Uh, thank you, Keith. Conventional wisdom in finance says that ordinary investors make all the errors illustrated, for example, in behavioral finance. However, these days, virtually every investment is intermediated either by an advisor, a fund manager, or I might add technology. So when things go wrong, it is by the professionals, not to mention all the massive fraud and malpractices, which have come entirely from the sell side. If the professionals make mistakes, uh, it is with other people's money. And it is notable that if there are lessons to be learned, the professionals are distinctly coy about sharing these lessons. Uh, so for me, might this explain some of the, the the somewhat difficult road you've had getting this going? And might it actually be something that the professionals ought to be pouring over your records and archives? Yeah, I think it's a brilliant question. And it, it really takes us to the difference between a, an agent and a principal and a different of incentives. The, the principal, which is what Keith calls the ordinary investor, has entirely different incentives than the profession to which he or she gives the money to. And it is those incentives for the agents, which are the main culprit in why finance works so badly. Uh, we get all this 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 things that should be changed. But unless you change the incentive of the agents, you will continue to get bad outcomes. Uh, Charlie Munger once said, never, ever think about anything when you should be thinking about incentives. So I, in my own life and profession, I try to work with principles. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of very clever agents out there, but their intelligence has to be matched against their incentive. And if their incentive is wrong, the intelligence, frankly, uh, is wasted. So people often ask me, what's the one thing you would do to change change the world based on what's in the library of mistakes? Actually, it's really nothing that's in the library of mistakes. It's change the incentives, because until you change the incentives and align them more closely to the ultimate principle, uh, the, the ordinary investor, uh, then it really isn't going to be, it isn't going to work. Now, the reason that obviously professional investors don't like to lay forward their mistakes as they can be sued, uh, which is not a question of incentives. Uh, so let us see if we can do something about the incentives uh, before everything else. And I think we'll begin to uh, fix Keith's problem that way. And financial history will be a nice adjunct, something extra to have on top of the incentives, but it has to be one or the other. Incentives above education, in my opinion. Well, um, sadly, I'll, I'll leave the audience to throw in their thanks in the bottom, which is always a sign I need to stop. But uh, this has been a fascinating three quarters of an hour. And I, I just want to close on one little bit. 
Um, there have been a, a number of attempts to look at, for example, conspiracy theory. Uh, most notably, I think uh, Cambridge University ran a five-year program on conspiracy theories with uh, Richard Evans and, and people. Um, and, and in finance, we, we often have this conspiracy theory versus cock-up, as we do everywhere else. Given all the things that you've looked up, uh, at, do you fall on one side or the other? Yeah, I, I very clearly fall on the uh, cock-up theory. I mean, the same people who will tell you that the government is conspiring to uh, assassinate the president and do everything else uh, will realize that the government uh, is pretty incompetent in just about every sphere of relationships they have with it on a day-to-day -day basis. So the idea that there's this dual process with the, incom the evident incompetence of the government over here, but somehow a secret government that works with, with, with huge competency, uh, a huge precision over here, seems to be an unlikely uh, an unlikely com uh, combination. So uh, cock up for me, not conspiracy. So you're not holding on to the tripartite, tripartite commission papers or anything. <laughs> Look, uh, it, I mean, we could go on as you gather. Um, just a couple of things I may, uh, I just couldn't resist uh, ending, given that you used all this stuff about spent grain. Um, <laughs> Paul Phillips absolutely loves your twist on the, the Dylan Thomas quote. And he says, I guess, Dylan's biggest mistake was that he couldn't count his whiskey. So, <laughs> well done, Paul. Uh, look, uh, three quick rounds of thanks, if I may, folks. Uh, firstly, uh, to our, our sponsors, who I, I know will have enjoyed this enormously and seen its value and importance. Uh, I think this is just an absolutely essential part of the path to putting finance on a much more solid footing. Uh, secondly, I would like to thank, if I may, you, the audience, uh, what a great job today and some, some superb stuff. It's make me look good when I can uh, feed quotes out. So thank you for all of that. Uh, a reminder, of course, that we have a number of events uh, coming up. And I don't normally try and pick something out, but I would, I would point you here to Tuesday, the 15th of June, uh, The Usefulness of Useful Knowledge, based on a book, The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge, uh, where we have Robert Dykraff at the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton the man who would, if time travel were possible, be Einstein's boss. Uh, and Robert is actually going to be talking in very similar veins uh, to Professor Napier. Uh, in other words, very much about where is this useless knowledge that we find in R&D and how do we turn it to advantage? Um, so you're going to have some fascinating things there. But obviously, the biggest thanks of all, Russell, to you. I understand you're sitting on some big news, and I shall respect that, but it makes it all the easier to have you back because uh, you'll have some fresh news to give us uh, later this year or next. And we'd love to keep track of this because this is such a, an overlooked area and one that anybody in any field, frankly, doesn't like dwelling on their mistakes. Uh, but as you say, you know, it, it's the, the right way to get the, you know, the, the right questions going rather than the right answers to the wrong questions. And so I'd like to thank you. Unfortunately, um, technology is not yet at the level of me being able to open the floodgates of applause, but I do have here my Korean karmic clapper, uh, which forms my kind of ersatz applause from the audience. And we will be passing on a, a number of uh, really nice compliments. Thank you so much for being with us today and look forward to seeing you. Thank you. And anybody watching this can also change the world one mistake at a time. We can all do it.